everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight for History as it Unfolds, Hoosiers and the Holocaust. Sundown tonight concludes, concludes Yom HaShoah, or Holocaust Remembrance Day. We are excited to bring you tonight's conversation in remembrance of all those whose lives were affected by the Holocaust. My name is Bethany Rokovec, and I serve as the Director of Education and Engagement for the Indiana Historical Society. I'm going to be going over just a few logistics before passing the mic over to our speakers for tonight. This program is presented in partnership with the Indiana Historical Bureau and the Indiana Jewish Historical Society. At the Indiana Historical Society, we are Indiana Storyteller, connecting people to the past. We collect paper-based items such as books, paintings, letters, photographs, diaries, maps, and more to tell Indiana's unique stories. <clears throat> we then find ways to share these stories through publications, exhibits, and events such as this. Through these documents, we tell the diverse stories of Indiana and inspire a future grounded in our state's uniting values and principles. Tonight, we will be exploring how Hoosiers learned about the events of the Holocaust with Jill Simmons and Callie McCune. But before I introduce Jill and Callie, I have a few pieces of logistics to go over. For this event, Jill and Callie are going to be talking for about 40 minutes and then we'll open it up to your questions. If you have questions as we go along, please drop it in the question and answer section of your Zoom screen. We'll keep an eye on them and then pepper those questions in as we get to the second half of our program. If you would like to add anything to the chat box, please don't forget to change your response to all panelists and attendees so that we can all see your thoughts. Keep an eye on that chat because I'll be dropping in some links and URLs throughout the conversation. But don't worry if you miss one, they're going to be delivered to your inbox in a follow-up email tomorrow morning. And finally, this program is being recorded. You can catch the replay on our website, indianahistory.org in the coming weeks. And if you enjoy this program, I hope you'll consider coming back for more. We have more programs coming up, including next week, where we will be talking with John Mutz, Edward France, and Indiana Historical Society's own President and CEO, Jody Blankenship, about John Mutz's life and biography. Participants can purchase a copy of the biography or attend the program only. We'll also be continuing our history happy hours on April 22nd with Michelle Gerald looking at the polio vaccine. And if you're looking for family history workshops, you can join us on April 24th, where Kurt Witcher from the Allen County Public Library Genealogy Center will guide us through how to do effective research at libraries. You can sign up for all of those and more at indianahistory.org. And now, without any further ado, I will turn it over to Callie McCune, our Manager of Engagement at the Indiana Historical Society, to introduce our guest. Take Thanks, it away, Beth. Callie. Thanks, Bethany. And welcome, everyone, to History as it Unfolds, What Hoosiers Knew About the Holocaust. As Bethany said, my name is Callie McCune, and I'm one of the engagement managers at the Indiana Historical Society. It's my honor to be here tonight with you on the 27th day of the Jewish month of Nisan to close out Yom HaShoah, the Jewish day of remembrance of the Holocaust and heroism, and talk about what Hoosiers knew about the Holocaust as it unfolded and how they were able to um, help combat it or not help combat it as the case may be. And we're going to do this with one of my favorite Indiana historians and friends, uh, Jill Wee Simmons. Um, Jill. Hey, Jill. Hey, thanks so, for that introduction. It's really good to be here on such an important day. Yeah, we're great to have you. So I'm going to tell people just a little bit about Jill. Um, her bio, I could go on for a long time, but I'll give you the snippet version. So Jill is the staff historian at the Indiana Historical Bureau, which is the division of the Indiana State Library. She's a lifelong Hoosier and has worked there since 2008, where she writes regularly for both the Indiana History blog and helps to produce the award-winning podcast, Talking Hoosier History. And just as an aside, if you haven't checked out their work at the Bureau, I hope you'll take a minute after this presentation to do that. Bethany, I'll drop a link to um, those in the 
in the chat. Um, but the Bureau is continually doing some of my favorite work on in-depth blog posts and great podcasts. If you want to know about suffrage or the Klan or the Cold War and everything in between, things that are really taking who's your history and then making it relevant today. Um, so if you've got a long road trip coming up, uh, check out those blog posts, um, including Jill's most recent uh, podcast on Rabbi Maurice Davis and all of his work around civil rights. Jill also comes out of the same program I do. She has an MA in public history from IUPUI, so shout out to the public history program. And she's currently the vice president for the Jewish Historical Society. Uh, so now that you know a little bit about Jill, we're going to dive into what you're all here to hear about, what Hoosiers knew about the Holocaust. So Jill, let's start with how did you become interested in this topic and start researching it? Yeah, so um, in 2016, I was in Washington, D.C. for work, um, and I went to the Holocaust Museum, and it was a really transformative experience, as I think it is for a lot of people that go there for the first time. Uh, I came away feeling like I just want to do something, uh, just a modest something to help forward their mission. So um, that's when I heard about the History Unfolded project and um, I decided I would start submitting articles to that. Um, that lets curators and scholars all over the nation um, have this great treasure trove of articles. Um, and then I just wanted to see if maybe I could work to make it relevant to uh, Hoosiers. Um, and so then I also did some blogging around the articles that I found. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of times Hoosiers feel removed from some of the national conversations around these events. So I really started to dig into um, what did Hoosiers know and what did they do? So um, we're always about trying to empower citizen historians. So can you tell us a little more about this History Unfolded project and maybe how people who are still stuck at home uh, could help out with it? Yeah, I like, I like that framing. We're all looking for things to do. Maybe we're tired of gardening. Um, so the Holocaust Museum asks anyone, um, like Callie said, a citizen historian, a history buff, a teacher, a student, um, to submit articles. Um, they give you 41 different events that you can choose from. They provide context for those events. They provide keywords and search terms to help you get started. So it's pretty easy. Um, and then you just dig into the newspaper database of your choice. Cool, that sounds like it's super, that's um, pretty easy to do. So um, how did you go about finding those newspapers here in Indiana to research in? So I started, um, as I almost always do when I'm researching in newspapers, I started with Hoosier State Chronicles. Um, this is not just a plug because Chronicles is uh, managed by the Indiana State Library, which is um, what the Indiana Historical Bureau is a part of. But Hoosier State Chronicles is free it's accessible to anyone. Um, it contains papers from small towns, rural places, large cities, industrial centers. It has African-American newspapers. It has the Indianapolis Jewish Post, which was especially helpful here. Um, it has newspapers of different political leanings. So I started there. Then I also used um, Newspaper Archive and Newspaper.com, which are behind paywalls. Uh, but a lot of libraries, including the State Library, have subscriptions. A lot of colleges, schools have subscriptions. Um, and sometimes the uh, History Unfolded Project even does a day, uh, or maybe it's a week, where you get a subscription just to contribute to the project. Um, so then I, I made sure that I looked at black papers, at Jewish papers, at a wide variety. But then I also made sure that I looked at the Indianapolis Star and the Indian Indianapolis News. Um, and that way I wasn't just seeing what are Hoosiers reading, I was seeing what are the most Hoosiers reading about the Holocaust. Gotcha. So I'm a historian too. I'm one of those girls that when I get a book and I'm reading the history book, I'm flipping to the back to see the 
all the site sources that are cited. I like to check other historians work and sometimes even get to dig into it too. So why are newspapers the right way to kind of get at this question of what Hoosiers knew about the Holocaust? So um, when the events really start unfolding um, in the early 1930s, um, literacy rates in the United States um, had improved greatly over the previous decades. Um, there was a lot going on in the news, um, stock market crash, crisis in Europe, um, expansion of government powers through the New Deal. People were invested in the news and um, they were interested. Also the wire syndicates like um, the Associated Press were able to meet those interests. So a small local paper could thrive um, by and compete by printing that international news. Um, by 1939, 70% of Americans got their news through newspapers. Most households got a newspaper. Um, so if we look at different papers with different political leanings, different lenses, um, we really can see what people were learning about the world. And um, what is most exciting to find, I, I think are the letters to the editor, the opinion pieces where we're also hearing what Hoosiers are thinking. So we've got the luxury of hindsight right now. Um, and there's, I think this myth that we might have in 2021 that Americans knew what was happening in the Holocaust versus what might've actually been happening as these events were unfolding. So what were you able to uncover in your research? Yeah, I think your question um, touches on a concept that's hard for us to wrap our heads around. Um, the Holocaust is such an important event that it's hard not to think of it as inevitable. Um, so when we're looking back at events like the opening of a concentration camp, um, you know, we are looking at it through the lens of knowing that this was going to become a place of genocide. But when it opened, it was a work camp. So we need to go back to those events leading up to it so that we can see that it, it wasn't inevitable. Um, it was a series of choices and steps, people who acted, people who didn't act. Um, so going back through these events really helps us to understand the path to genocide and look for warning signs to prevent these tragedies in the future. So let's tackle this question that they're all here to learn about. Um, what did Hoosiers actually know about the Holocaust? And I think you kind of tried to get at that using these very specific events that the Holocaust Museum lays out in its project, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the most surprising thing is that they knew a lot about the events leading up to the Holocaust. Now, they couldn't imagine the scale of the atrocity. So these weren't events leading up to anything, as we were kind of just saying. Um, but they did have a lot of access to the information um, about what was happening in the 1930s. Um, some of these events were glossed over. They were um, sometimes misinterpreted. Sometimes propaganda got repeated. Sometimes they were confined to the back pages and small articles. But really, they did have ample information about the horrors that the Jews of Europe were facing as early as the as early as 1933. Um, also, Hoosiers had opinions on these events. Um, we see columnists arguing that the US needs to stay out of European affairs. We see other columnists arguing for people to take action to help asylum seekers. We see um, African-American writers arguing that there's enough prejudice and violence to combat at home. Why are we looking over here to um, other people's problems? And we have other voices pleading for the admittance of more refugees or um, the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. So really the whole gamut of opinions and voices. So let's step to the beginning. We're talking around like 1933. How did Hoosiers start hearing about the Holocaust? And was this news delayed? Like how secret were the Germans being about this? Yeah, so again, they had a surprising amount of access. Um, so when the first Nazi concentration camp opens in 1933, um, which it opened to hold political prisoners, it was only a few weeks later 
that um, this article on the screen here from Logansport uh, published a United Press article reporting that Nazi guards had shot and killed several escaping prisoners. Um, other newspapers in Seymour, Tipton, and Rushville ran AP articles um, on rumors of, quote, wholesale murders in Germany and stated that um, prisoners at camps were being murdered. Um, and they did mention that these reports couldn't be verified. Um, on, on the, in the same period, still in the spring of 33, um, we saw lots of articles on the anti-Jewish boycott. Um, this was, is just a direct insight. These articles are an insight into the Nazi propaganda machine. Um, so as stormtroopers were attacking Jewish stores, removing Jewish judges and lawyers from courtrooms, Jewish doctors, students, um, publicly humiliating. Um, um, American Jewish organizations were reporting on these and then calling for a boycott, an international boycott of German goods. Well, the German uh, propaganda machine spun this concept, um, blamed uh, Jews in Germany for spreading propaganda and um, reversed it and said, well, we're going to then boycott Jewish businesses. Their message was clear. It was, don't get involved in our affairs or we will come harder. Uh, we will come down harder on Jewish people. Um, Hoosier newspapers thoroughly covered these. Uh, unlike some of the national papers, they put some of these stories on page one. So that, that's something that's a little bit different here. Um, the Alexandria Times Tribune reported uh, that this boycott amounted to the practical extermination of Jews or reduction of their position to serfdom. Uh, they're using the word extermination to mean like financial and civil life, not murder, but it's still extremely chilling. Um, another Indiana paper said that uh, reporting on a Nazi party proclamation said that this uh, action was the beginning of a war on the entire Jewish race of the world. And as we know, this is exactly what happens. Uh, they took away Jews' civil rights and then their human rights. That's all kind of, that's pretty fascinating. Do you have one example that stood out to you the most as you were sort of digging into these specific events? Yeah, so the one that I come back to again and again, and I think is really powerful, um, has to do with the Wagner Rogers bill and um, either in the chat or in a follow-up email, um, I did work with the uh, organization called Reimagining Migration to make teacher resources for this um, event. Uh, so if there's any teachers out there that want to tackle a difficult subject, um, we can make that available. Um, so while the prevailing attitudes in the United States towards immigration um, were extremely negative, um, some hoped that their fellow Americans would make an exception for child refugees. So in 1939, um, the Wagner Rogers bill was that hope um, that this bill could bring in 20,000 children escaping Nazi Germany to the United States um, over two years. So 10, only 10,000 a year. Um, so Clarence Pickett, who was an Earlham college professor, so an Indiana college professor, actually drafted the bill. Uh, then Senators Wagner and, uh, or Senator Wagner and Representative Rogers introduced the legislation. Um, and that, so this would have brought children in outside of the established quota. Um, I'm sure we'll circle back to the quota system, but this quota system was really strict. It only allowed in a certain number of asylum seekers so they were trying to say, let's make an exception for children, like just for children. Um, so the Indianapolis Jewish Post editor, Gabriel Cohen, argued passionately in the pages of the Post for congressional action. He said, enough with the prayers, enough with the well wishes, it's time to act. Um, let's stop waiting for an executive action from Roosevelt, or let's stop putting the onus on uh, humanitarian, uh, philanthropic organizations. It's time to demand that um, these children be let in 
um, it's time he said the conscious of America should demand it. Um, so he also wrote to through the pages of the post to congressional leaders saying the support for these children is available. Jewish families will step up and take these children in. And he was absolutely right. Um, at the committee hearings, uh, the Child Welfare League presented hundreds of letters from families um, saying that they would take the children. Um, they reported they had 12 applications for adoption for every child. Um, there was also opposition, of course. Um, the main opposition in, in Indiana came from the American Legion um, who actually met in a special session in Indianapolis to make their formal stance on this issue. Um, so they decided to stand against the bill um, with their large number of members. This was a pretty powerful decision. Um, they claimed that while the children weren't threats to job seekers, which was one of the arguments against um, allowing in more immigrants, while they weren't threats now, they would be in just a few years. They claimed to be morally against taking children and splitting up families as if the families weren't already separated. Um, and their final claim was that there were plenty of children in the US who needed help, so why look abroad? Even though their organization was not involved in helping children here or there. Um, and actually a local, um, a Franklin, Indiana American Legion chapter encouraged them to go further. Um, they asked that they also, that the Legion also request a 10 year cur curtailment of all immigration. And the Legion accepted that and made that part of their stance. Um, somewhat surprisingly, I guess, um, considering the arguments around jobs, the local uh, labor unions were very supportive of this bill. They said long before these children will be looking for jobs, they're going to be consumers. So it would even out. But um, in, in that committee then, um, the bill just kept being amended and amended. Um, they said, well, we'll let the kids in, but we're gonna count it against the quota or um, we're gonna let the kids in, but then we're gonna close all immigration for five years. So, you know, this, this wasn't the purpose of the bill. So um, Senator Reynolds with, or um, Sen Senator Wagner withdrew the bill. Um, the largest or the loudest voice against it in Congress um, was reported by the Jewish Post. And I think the quote is interesting. It is um, the Jewish Post quoted Senator Bob Reynolds from North Carolina, who said, I would today build a wall about the United States so high and so secure that not a single alien or foreign refugee from any country upon the face of this earth could scale or ascend it. And um, the editor of the Jewish Post wrote in response, tens of thousands of innocent children are now exposed to a life of torture or to slow painful death. America must do its share. Let's open our gates to outstretched hands. And his estimate of course is early and conservative. Um, we know now that 1.5 million children were killed in the Holocaust, so. So before we get into sort of actions that Hoosiers were able to take, let's keep talking about this refugee moment a little bit. So in 38, 39, we know that applications for asylum seekers went up like 58%, um, but Hoosiers had strong opinions on both sides. So can you give us a little background on what was going on here? Um, I've, and then maybe some of the organizations or personalities on those debates. Obviously, I assume the American Legion is one of them based here in Indianapolis. So that has a strong tie to Indiana. Definitely. Right? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, while applications for visas for asylum continue to rise throughout the 30s, um, immigration itself didn't increase. Um, this is because thousands of visas went unused. Um, the United States had made the visa process almost impossible. Um, the first obstacle obviously was the quota system itself, which targeted certain groups for exclusion, which included European Jews. So only very small numbers of Jews were um, allowed in in this quota system. Um, but even within that pool of potential visas, um, 
Jews fleeing persecution were still unable to immigrate. And that is because they had to collect so many types of documents. They needed proof of identity. They needed certificates signed by the police, medical clearances, tax documents. And some of these would be things that they needed to get from Nazi officials. Um, they also needed expensive things like ship tickets, exit permits. Um, they needed an American financial sponsor to prove that they wouldn't become a burden on um, the US financially. Um, and, you know, of course they had had, many had had their property and all their wealth confiscated. So this made it impossible. Additionally, the State Department would still reject people that got all those documents in place for reasons of national security and send them back um, to gather more documents. Um, so by 1938, then there were 30, there were 300,000 asylum seekers waiting for visas. And by the time the U.S. entered the war, um, immigration was basically the door was closed. So how does this reflect a little bit on who we think is American? Because I know there's a lot of that sentiment around German Americans at that at this time or Japanese Americans and internment. So how does this maybe reflect on Jewish Americans too? Um, yeah, so I think, I think what you're getting at is um, like, what are the lessons today? Like today, if we're still saying that some people get to come in and some people don't. Um, so I think it's important to remember that while the targeted group changes, um, the reasons for keeping people out don't really change. Um, you know, when people are in positions of power and they feel threatened, then they try to exclude those people. And, you know, I think this was true in the 18th century when Americans of English descent tried to keep out German immigrants. It's true again in the 19th century then when Americans of English and German descent try to keep out Irish and Chinese immigrants. And it becomes true in the 20th century when um, we're seeing um, white Protestant um, um, Americans, Hoosiers, turning fear, their fear and hate towards the increase of Eastern European immigration, but it's the same fear. Um, they just justified it with eugenics, with pseudoscience, um, anti-Semitism, but it comes down to just a fear of um, political, financial, and social dominance. Um, I also think that a wider view of history shows immigration as an ongoing human condition something that different groups of people go through at different times um, that, you know, in the 1930s, this was um, Jewish Europeans, but um, it doesn't need to become a crisis. If the asylum seekers from uh, Nazi persecution teach us anything, it should be that um, refugees are a humanitarian issue, uh, not a political crisis, that humankind as a whole has a responsibility to people fleeing persecution. Uh, this includes our um, individuals, it includes educational institutions, philanthropic and uh, religious organizations, um, and official channels, of course. Um, I think the Holocaust stands as a reminder to us about what can happen when we turn our back on refugees, uh, especially I said I'll keep going back to the child refugees. Um, I think it's worth thinking back on how we rejected child refugees in the 1930s um, because children under 18 today make up uh, more than half of the 22 million people seeking refuge today. So sometimes we hear these statistics like that. We hear them all the time and we hear all the negative news. Um, you know, the problems feel remote. We, our empathy gets exhausted. Uh, but this is exactly how people were feeling in the 1930s. Well, gotcha. I think that's there's a lot of parallels to go what's kind of going on right now and how we grapple with that. Um, and we'll kind of, I think maybe at the end, jump back into some of those parallels. But I want to talk about the people that took action um, yeah. and maybe not, 
as the child of a Holocaust educator, we talk about bystanders and complicity a lot, and especially within that German context of society. So, but we know there are some Hoosiers that did act and you found that in your research. So can you tell us a little bit about some that maybe let's start with what were they learning and reading about? And then some maybe everyday Hoosiers that took a stand. Yeah. So as you can imagine, there were people that acted and people that didn't, um, it, you know, as we were kind of just saying for a lot of people, the problems of Europe seem far away. They were dealing with financial problems from the depression, um, the memory of loss from the first world war or just, you know, your daily, uh, life and problems. Um, but others had, you know, strong, hateful feelings towards immigrants, towards Jews. Um, you have to remember that this is less than a decade after um, the, the Klan dissolved, in, which was especially powerful in Indiana and um, did affect uh, in impact immigration legislation. Um, but there were a lot of people who acted. This is my favorite thing to study. Um, so I will just give a couple examples. My favorite, favorite Hoosier who acted um, is James Grover McDonald. He's a diplomat that was born in Albany, Indiana, and he dedicated his entire career to helping refugees. So um, I just gave an hour lecture on this. So I think we'll send people the link for that. Um, that was just a little while ago. Maybe there were people here now that were also at that. So. I will leave him there. He um, is definitely worth learning more about. Um, but there were other political leaders who did act like um, Paul McNutt, who was the governor of Indiana from 33 to 37, and then the high commissioner, high commissioner to the Philippines in the late 1930s. Um, and he was able to sort of circumvent the US visa policies by bringing 1,300 Jewish refugees to the islands, um, a number that probably would not have gotten through the State Department. So, um, you know, quite a heroic rescue mission. Um, local Indiana colleges and universities. Um, I just started researching this the other day. I was very excited to find um, that Erlom College and Wabash College and Indiana University accepted refugee students and provided grants to scholars who wouldn't have otherwise received visas, um, which saved their lives and set them on a path towards success in the United States. Um, I, this is like my next project. I'm excited to go digging into these records. Um, but as far as just an average Hoosier, um, she's still sort of a person of means, but um, Sarah Wolf Goodman, um, has really become a standout Hoosier to me. Um, so she was a Jewish community leader, a big supporter of the arts. She was involved with founding the Indianapolis Symphony. Um, and she was actually born in Vienna. So she had a personal tie. Um, she came to the US as a child and to um, Indianapolis in the 1920s after she married Jack Goodman who um, was the founder of the Real Silk Hoosier, uh, the Real Silk Hosiery Mills. Um, so in May of 1938, the National Youth Alia Committee identified a thousand Jewish Austrian children who had valid visas to leave the country, but that that would close in September. So she only had from May to September when she heard about this to act. And I think as herself an Austrian born Jew, um, doing nothing was not an option to her. She was smart, she was ambitious, she was well-connected. Um, but I would say, you know, while, while she had some money and some connections, still an average person, not a diplomat, not a politician. Um, so she, she did exactly that, she acted. Um, so she wrote to the Jewish Post and said that she had received a letter from a 14-year-old girl who said, who had raised $10 baking cookies and asked Mrs. Goodman to please accept the money and send it to help the lives of these poor children of Austria. She was inspired. Um, she came up with a simple plan, 
which was uh, based on this little girl's generosity, thinking that if children knew about the plight of these other children, they wouldn't want all of these lavish graduation gifts that were about to be um, doted on them as they graduated in May. So she, through the Jewish Post, called on families and friends of graduates to make a donation in the name of a graduate in lieu of a gift that she would send to the Youth Alaya Fund. Um, in all, she was able to save two children. Uh, she raised a modest $750 um, through this collection plan. Um, it might not seem like much, but um, we are still in the midst of the Great Depression. The average annual income was about $1,000. Um, so she raised almost a year's salary for the effort. Um, she got no promotional help for her idea from any of the other newspapers that I could find, except for the Post. Despite that, somehow her idea spread. I'm not, I haven't exactly pinpointed. I'm guessing through um, other editors looking at the Post, but um, Cincinnati, Memphis, Miami, New Orleans, Los Angeles, Seattle, and Washington all uh, followed suit. And in all, 1,000 children were saved through Goodman's simple plan. Wow, I, that's, um, there are so many like little connections of like what I know about Hoosier history that now I wanna dig into her more. And I'm so glad that we're also giving her back her name. So she's not just Miss Jack um, Goodman, but yes. she is. Yes, uh, I always try to make a point to go to. <laughs> as go to like, it's still in my little thing there. Um, we've got some great questions coming into the Q&A in the chat and keep those coming. We'll get to them in about 10-ish minutes. We'll transition into those, but I wanted to kind of work one in. Uh, one of our one of the people in the chat, Judy, talked about a family in Goshen that sponsored families at their own cost. So if we have guests that are finding their own research or know of families, how can they help continue this work, Jill? Yeah, I would um, make sure you go to the History Unfolded site. It just takes a few minutes. You make an account um, and get those stories into that national database because that's where scholars are looking as we try to figure out what Americans knew. And um, you know, right now that's the exhibit at the US Holocaust Museum is what Americans knew. I think the logical next step is um, you know, what did they do? So I think if um, people would make sure that they submit those articles and um, especially um, look for you know letters to the editor and opinion pieces that show you know it's great when we know why they're doing um that as well but that's so interesting i would love to see those but. um so i when i was kind of going through some of the blog posts you've written i was really fascinated about the trajectory that you took into the indianapolis recorder which is Indiana's oldest black newspaper. And we're lucky that it has been digitized, I think first through the IUPUI libraries and now it's in Hoosier Chronicles. So yeah. it's this really unique lens into what Hoosiers were talking about over, I think it's like they started in 1860-ish. So yeah. quite a long time. Yeah. Um, so how were those events covered there? And did that look different than the white papers? Um, it definitely looked different. And in a lot of ways, it looked more like what the Jewish Post was doing. So the recorder um, wasn't just printing the wire articles. Most of the um, uh, like standard papers were printing the AP articles, the UP articles. The recorder um, had more columns. They had more opinion pieces. Um, and they had calls to action like the Jewish Post did. Um, so for example, we mentioned the uh, anti-Jewish boycott. Uh, the recorder was the only paper that I could find that ran an editorial. Um, they had some strong words for it. They called this um, persecution, long pent up race hatred, prejudice and treachery, a reign of terror against the Jews a crime against society. And um, they concluded with uh, the statement, world peace was never in such jeopardy as it is today. And since the assumption of power of Germany's dictator. 
Now that's a pretty clear vision for 1933. Um, so I, I've been very impressed that through the lens of you know, their own oppression that they were able to see how bad this could get. I mean, at this, in the 1930s, um, the United States has a terrible problem with lynching. So, you know, the, the bridge from hate speech to violence is very clear. Um, another noticeable difference then was that the recorder was making those parallels. Um, again, this is long before um, anyone, well, long before mass killings started, you know, very long before um, anybody could even imagine that. Um, but they did um, create comparisons um, saying things like America should put its own house in order before telling Germany what to do. So, I mean, powerful words. And I think an important, always an important paper, like whatever you're researching, um, you know, check out what the recorder has to say. And we always like to make a plug when we're talking about the recorder. If you know where years 1918 to 1920, or there's a couple months in 1921, if they're in your basement, will you let us at the Historical Society or at the History Bureau know yeah. we are missing those dates and they would give us such important insight to things that were going on in Indiana from the rise of the Klan to women voting and so much in between. So I always like to give a plug. Yeah. If you know where the recorder is, let us know. <laughs> or, or the 1933 Jewish Post. I think we only have one issue of that. So if that's in your basement, I'll come get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we love finding things in basements sometimes. Yeah. So are there examples of events that you found that the U.S. did, that the U.S. or Hoosiers did nothing of even when there are major incidents being reported? Yeah, so I think as far as an incident that was super widely reported um, and that, you know, no action was taken by any Hoosiers that I could find, but also um, the United States also turned its back was um, the um, SS St. Louis, the ship um, that was carrying um, asylum seekers to Cuba and they had valid visas for Cuba and many were on the waiting list for the United States quota system. So they thought that they would go to Cuba. There was already a decent amount of refugees in Cuba at the time. So they, many were planning to join friends and family there. Um, right before the ship arrived, Cuban leaders had changed their mind largely because of um, anti-Semitic protests and they refused them entry. So this. Um, this giant ship is docked, you know, is docked here for days while um, Jewish organizations and other um, aid organizations tried to negotiate on their behalf. Um, so Indiana newspapers reported um, just the tragedy of this whole thing. The, the image you see on the right is um, these little boats that began to encircle the ship that were full of the family and friends of these refugees who had previously arrived in Cuba. So they could speak to each other and they could wave to each other, um, but they couldn't be reunited. Um, so eventually, you know, the ship was sent back to Europe and Hoosier newspapers reported extensively um, about the trip along the Florida coast, how they could see the lights of uh, Miami but uh, the Coast Guard followed them to make sure that they didn't illegally land. Um, you know, James McDonald, who I didn't uh, get to do my spiel on, he was one of the people negotiating, appealing to Roosevelt, appealing to Eleanor Roosevelt, appealing to the State Department. Um, you know, Roosevelt could have issued an executive order um, to allow these couple hundred uh, refugees outside of the quota system, but um, you know he didn't because of the uh, anti-immigration feeling in Congress and in the country as a whole. Um, so even though people were reading across the country sympathetic stories and editorials, nothing was done. This is just a complete failure on the part of um, the United States to act. So. Um, 
you can uh, see an exhibit at the Holocaust Museum online about what they know about each of these refugees. And so while many of them were returned to uh, neutral countries as, um, or countries at peace as the Nazi occupation spread through Europe, many of these refugees were eventually killed in ghettos and concentration camps. And you can follow their you know, family stories throughout that journey. So I want to give, um, if, can you maybe do a, I, I don't want to keep people from knowing about how great James McDonald was. So can you give us like two minutes on him? And then if you yeah. the whistle, they can go see the hour long talk, but I don't want to lose. Um, he's super cool and has a lot of influence post the Holocaust too. Yeah. So, um, McDonald was born in Ohio, but he grew up in Albany, Indiana. Um, that's where he went to school. He worked in his parents' um, hotel. He met his wife. Um, his parents were of um, German ancestry. They were Catholic. They were very invested in sending him and his brothers to school. So he went to Indiana University um, he went on to get a master's there. He went to Harvard and then he came back to IU as a professor. Um, so he taught there for some time until he got a job in 1918 as the, uh, as a representative of the foreign policy association. Uh, so he traveled a lot at, as part of that, uh, job and he happened to be in Berlin during the anti-Jewish boycott in 1933, he was extremely disturbed by what he saw. Um, he was just amazingly able to meet with high ranking Nazi officials, including Hitler's press secretary and Hitler himself. Uh, McDonald had, um, you know, there, he speculates on why he had earlier gotten on a list of scholars who might be sympathetic to Germany, which is a long story um, about having to do with his teaching about World War I. Um, and then uh, he also just had these Aryan features. He's a tall uh, man with blue eyes and blonde hair. So he met with Hitler and um, he, I mean, he was just shocked. He was chilled to the bone. Hitler said that he, the world doesn't know what to do with the Jews, I will show them. So he returned from Berlin. He met with uh, the prominent rabbi, Stephen Wise. He met with uh, President Roosevelt. He met with represent, representatives of the leading Jewish organizations, um, other foreign policy organizations, State Department, Eleanor Roosevelt. He started his advocacy. He's, you know, of course he didn't, predict the Holocaust, but he could see that this was going to be a catastrophe um, for Germany's uh, Jews. And um, so he was extremely active from that point on. He later that year went to a League of Nations assembly where the League was sort of posturing that it was going to help with the refugee crisis. It, Surely there were people there that wanted to help, but they also were trying not to lose Germany as a member state. They thought that uh, Germany's membership in the league was the only thing standing between it and rearmament. So um, it created this completely toothless subcommittee called, um, I always have to look at my notes for this one, uh, the High Commission for Refugees, Jewish and other coming from Germany. So President Roosevelt put McDonald's name forward he becomes head of this committee that um, has no funding from the league, no assistance from the league. Um, the high commissioner has to raise his own budget, has to use his own context for negotiations. Um, and at the same time, it was tasked with negotiating with Germany to relieve the refugee crisis, raising private funds to help the refugees and then finding countries to take them. So obviously negotiating with Germany was not gonna happen. Um, he was very successful raising funds, linking organizations with similar missions to like enhance their power. 
and um, just hit a brick wall with progress when it came to finding countries to take refugees. Um, as an American, many of these countries said, United States isn't taking anyone, like, why should we? In fact, some of the countries looked to him to take the refugees they already had. So he worked for years in this job before publicly resigning in a really powerful statement um, that was in part a moral argument and in part a legal argument for, inter for the league to intercede. Um, by 1938, then he was, um, on a very similar United States organ, uh, committee that Roosevelt had created that was the President's Advisory Committee on Political Refugees. Um, Mc, Roosevelt made McDonald chairman of that committee whose purpose was supposed to be to advise Roosevelt and the State Department um, on the refugee situation. But as we know, the State Department didn't want anyone's advice. They weren't gonna act. Um, he was in the same position again um, but he did have some like some really powerful successes despite all these obstacles. Um, he was essential in admitting 81 refugees um, from uh, Jewish refugees from Germany that had made it to Portugal. Um, he was essential in uh, letting hundreds of rabbis, rabbinical students, Jewish thinkers and scholars, um, getting them visas and um, getting them to the United States. Um, he played a major role in uh, securing visas for 5,000 Jewish children that were in France. Um, he was an important part of negotiations with the Bolivian government, um, getting them to take 20,000 refugees. Um, and then just between 1940 and 1942, not counting the um, people just mentioned, uh, McDonald and the advisory committee secured visas for 2,133 refugees that wouldn't have otherwise found safe haven. And I know that when we're thinking about 6 million people who died in the Holocaust versus placing 2,133, that sounds so small and it is, but that each one is still a life. Um, so I always like to make the comparison, um, you know, Oscar Schindler, who, you know, we all know the story through Schindler's List. It's a powerful story. He's credited with saving 1,100 lives. So we have to like put in perspective the wins, even though the losses are so painful um, and overwhelming. But. Right. So if you want to know more, uh, we'll definitely drop that link to Jill's talk in the chat. And then we have a thank you email that you'll get tomorrow, probably before noon. Um, and that will definitely have a link to the talk so you can go learn more about this important Hoosier. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions. We've gotten some great ones in the chat and the Q&A. Feel free to keep those coming uh, for us if you see them or if you have them. Uh, how we have a couple of questions about sort of what was the German American reaction to mm -hmm. what the Nazis were doing and sort of was this being reported as everyday Germans doing it or Nazis doing it. Um, I don't know if you were, I'd be curious, we have a lot of German newspapers, right? Were you able to look at those? I'm not, so I don't want to call out your not your non multilingual skill. I know. No, I Kelly. No, um, I don't know the answer to that question for an interesting reason. And that is largely that after World War One, because of all of the anti German sentiment, um, you know, places had to, places with German names chain had to change their names, um, schools banned the teaching of German, um, most of the German newspapers folded during World War One. So um, I do not have access to a German newspaper for this period. Um, if there is one, I just don't know about it. But yeah, it's a great question. And there's definitely a hole in the research there that um, somebody should jump in and look into. Uh, did the US have any organizations like the British did that take in children? I think we're refer referring to the kinder transport in this question. Um, yeah, there were private organizations that were doing that work, um, and they did have um, some success, including um, 
uh, some of the Jewish organizations that I mentioned McDonald was working with, um, they had more success getting, uh, raising funds to bring Jewish children to Palestine. So a lot of those um, organizations, like we talked about with the Sarah Goodman example, like uh, the Youth Alaya organization are bringing, uh, so it's, you know, a lot of times Indiana money going to a national organization to bring children to Palestine, which as hard as that was, it was easier than getting them into the United States. Uh, were there churches, maybe Catholic organizations or others that were instrumental in getting refugees here too? Yeah, so um, the, the record of the Quakers are, is especially impressive. Um, you know, they were not only working here, trying to bring children here, but they were putting themselves in danger in Europe through their various rescue missions. Um, same with the Unitarians. Um, they were very involved as well. Um, you know, a lot of times McDonald's was very frustrated with the churches. Um, he didn't want well wishes and prayers. Um, he wanted action. So while individual churches, we definitely have examples of fundraisers and whatnot. Um, you know, they weren't contributing money on the scale of the Jewish organizations. Um what impact did the depression have on the opinions regarding Jewish refugees? I think you mentioned this a tiny bit, but can you elaborate a little more? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, a lot of these immigration policies were in place um, because of the 1924 Johnson Reed Act. So um, that's what established the quota system. So that was very much like locked and in place, but as the depression hit, it really solidified public opinion against um, any increase in immigration, even in the case of the catastrophe in Europe. So, you know, people saw immigrants as potential competition for jobs. They worried that they could become a drain on public funds. Um, you know, as, as we know, um, you know, from historians, from economists, immigrants generate, generate um, as much, um, uh, you know, revenue as they take. So, you know, it's, it's an understandable argument, but it is not a correct argument. But it absolutely impacted, you know, people, people were afraid as they are um, in any kind of recession. And then um, I think at certain points, almost 30% of people were out of work. So it's, I mean, it is to some extent understandable. Right. What, can we get a little context about what did the Jewish population look like in Indiana in this period? So we talk about the Jewish organizations being involved, but how many of us were there here? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that. I don't know that, um, you know, that, the, um, at least in Indianapolis, I guess I know that best, um, you know, it's a fairly large population. Um, there's very active synagogues, there's very active women's groups and, um, you know, the philanthropic groups that, so it is like a, a, a network of people already connected um, the German Jewish immigrants who had, you know, immigrated in previous generations had done very well in Indiana. Um, and so they did have uh, more capital than the later um, Eastern European Jewish immigrants. So the, it, it really is the German Jewish descendants, uh, you know, generations that were leading a lot of this work but I don't know about numbers. That's an interesting question. Yeah, and I will say that we know there are congregations of Jews in Evansville and Fort Wayne in, um, I'm sure up near the, re what we call yeah. the region. Um, we have, I think, I know at IHS, we have many of those documents. I don't actually know the answer either. Um, and there's also some really interesting in Indianapolis, especially these like, the difference between the Jews that are coming here from maybe 
um, North Africa, what we call Spartac Jews versus mm -hmm. the Jews that are coming from Eastern Europe or Germany. So mm -hmm. I think that there's definitely more that we can dig into. Oh. Um, and I bet the Jewish Historical Society has lots on it if you guys want to learn more there. Yeah. And, and actually the collection of the Indiana Jewish Historical Society is at the Indiana Historical Society um, with those collection guides online. Um, and more and more is digitized all the time. Um, the uh, the the Indiana Jewish Journal is all online through the Historical Society. So um, I definitely, definitely encourage people to explore those and learn about the different um, Jewish communities all over the state, some of which are still here and thriving and some of which um, have sunsetted. But. Uh, this is a great question. Did you find in your research how the refugees were received or treated when they, if they were lucky enough to get a visa here? So um, I have not gone extensively down that road. Um, one thing I've been doing is making a list of the students, like how I said, I just started looking into the uh, colleges. So I am keeping a list and I want to do exactly that is see how did these students do. Um, one thing interesting that I did find was um, the uh, newcomers, the Indianapolis Jewish newcomers was a little group that was established before, um, I, I think maybe even the, in the late 19th century, but um, they did make it their job to greet other Jewish newcomers, um, like new Jewish immigrants. So that's another route too that I'm interested in learning more about. And they did actually place a small, uh, modest little memorial. So I'd like to look that up more, but yeah, I don't, I don't know that anybody has studied the trajectory of the refugees that we can identify. And I will say that um, there is, we have done some work as like, a, I can, we, at IHS specifically around some refugees that came after the Holocaust, yeah. so post-war, um, we had a fabulous exhibit a few years ago called Mrs. Kaplan's Kitchen, which looked at one family who was resettled here. So there is some work with the eight Jewish agencies post-war, but you know, it's a little bit different than our context. Yeah, and um, you guys are, you know, working on stuff on Eva Core too, and she's a great example of, you know, a lot of people um, who survived the Holocaust, then spent a long time in displaced persons camps. They went to other countries for a while, um, and then they came uh, to the United States uh, eventually. So it can be kind of hard to um, track that. So it's always important, um, you know, when we do hear from Indiana Holocaust survivors and at the Jewish Historical Society, um, you know, we're trying to gather those stories. Um, Michael Brown, who's our new um, director, has been starting to gather interviews for a podcast. So look for that coming. So we'll be learning more, um, hopefully, about that topic. Right. And I do want to um, put a plug in, keep an eye out for at the Historical Society in spring of 2022, we'll be opening an exhibit on Eva Core. Um, it's shaping up to be really, really interesting. Um, I can't share much yet, but keep an eye out for that. Um, and Jill's, thanks Jill for helping us put that together. <laughs> Sally told me to do that. <laughs> I do have, um, I kind of want to wrap up with one last question. Um, we've seen a big rise in anti-Semitism and xenophobia across the country. So can we talk, just kind of end with some of the parallels between 1938 and 2021 that you see and how maybe we can bring some of those lessons to today and what maybe our guests can do? Because sometimes it feels like you don't know what to do when you're seeing these things reported in our own newspapers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the most important lesson of the Holocaust is a national and international and a personal dedication to never again let something like this happen. Um, but as we know, there have been several genocides since the Holocaust. Um, so this continues to happen. Um, so looking back to the 1930s, we see 
that the first step to the Holocaust was dehumanizing words um, and ideas and propaganda, forwarding anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Um, you know, it was words, not camps first. Um, so today, when we hear these kinds of ideas, um, you know, we stand against them in the ways that we can in our own realm of influence. Um, when we hear them from our community leaders or our political leaders, you know, we march, we demand their removal, we vote them out. Um, we don't remain bystanders um, because we don't want to be complicit through our silence. Um, I think one thing for Hoosiers to think about is, you know, after the Holocaust, um, Black and Jewish Hoosiers came together um, to work towards greater civil rights for Black Hoosiers. Uh, you know, I think they were working together, um, Jewish organizations like the JCRC and um, the NAACP were working to desegregate um, an Indianapolis movie theater as early as 1948. Um, as we know that, as Callie mentioned, this work remains unfinished. Um, so we need this kind of intersectional cooperation um, to defend our fellow Hoosiers, whether it's against anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, institutional racism against Blacks, um, human rights violations um, of asylum seekers. Um, and like Callie said, there's so much to do that it seems overwhelming um, that can discourage people from doing anything but you, you only need to start on one small thing um, most of us either have time talent or treasure at some point th those change so i would say apply one of those privileges um, and your skills towards something um, so there's a few thing, a few websites up here to learn more. Um, Exodus Refugees is bringing, working to bring asylum seekers to Indiana. Um, you know, Candles and um, IJHS are working to educate people. Um, like, let's learn from this and let's collect and save our experiences. Um, the JCRC is always at, on the front lines working for social justice. And then, you know, if you're um, a scholarly homebody person, which I am, I'm not necessarily a frontline marcher, um, you can do your advocacy in a way that's comfortable for you. Um, so I would say a very easy thing to do is to go to the Holocaust Museum's website, make your account for History Unfolded and make sure you get those stories like the one um, that we heard about today that I'd never heard. So, yeah. Yeah. And I will say that JCRC is a great organization that I'm, I'm always impressed when I see them in the thirties or forties, when I'm looking at historic documents. And then even today, the team out there, um, is doing a lot to make sure that we're continuing the conversation and fighting anti-Semitism when we see it both in our community and overseas. So we'll send you all of those opportunities um, in your email tomorrow um, in ways you can get involved. So, and if you have other questions, you can always feel free to reach out to us or Jill um, and we can help you out or try to connect you to the right people if you're wanting to dig into this. But we're running close to time. So I wanted to say thank you so much, Jill, for taking the time to talk to us tonight. I'm so glad we can highlight the work that you're doing and I'm excited to see what happens next. Uh, and especially with some of those students at those local universities. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It, it's really an honor to be here and you asked just really great questions and made it relevant to some of the things we're facing today. So thanks so much. As my mother would say, I've been asking questions since I was <laughs> short and they couldn't you know, reach the counter. Uh, so with that, I wanna toss it back over to Bethany uh, to wrap us up for the night. Thank you both so much to Callie and to Jill. This has been a wonderful conversation. I mean, I can safely say that I've learned so much and I know we've only begun to scratch the surface here. So thank you both so much for taking the time to share this information and these stories with us tonight. 
And thank you as well to our participants for joining us tonight. Um, if you have enjoyed this program, we hope that you'll consider coming back for more. Next week, we'll have John Mutz, Edward France, and IHS President and CEO Jody Blankenship, and they'll be discussing Mr. Mutz's legacy here in Indianapolis. And then further afield, we do have our history happy hours returning with programs on the polio vaccine, women in racing, the Works Progress Administration, and even more. You can sign up for all of these and find out even more about our virtual offerings at indianahistory.org slash visit slash calendar. And as Jill and Callie mentioned, I hope that you'll stay tuned for information coming in early 2022 about our upcoming exhibit on Eva Kaur and her legacy. We're gonna post this conversation to the IHS YouTube channel and to our website in the upcoming weeks. And in the meantime, if you'd like to revisit any of our previous free programs, you can check out the History Happy Hour playlist on YouTube or at the link that Callie is gonna drop in the chat for you. If you missed your chance to donate or would like to make a further gift to support the Indiana Historical Society, please visit indianahistory.org slash contribute slash donate. Your donation helps us to continue to share Hoosier stories around the state and beyond. As Callie mentioned, you're gonna get an email from us tomorrow morning with all of these links and a survey included. It'll take you about one to two minutes to complete the survey. We'd love to know what you thought about tonight's program and your feedback does help us make all of our programs better. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I hope you stay safe and stay healthy and we can't wait to see you at a program in the future. Thank you, everyone. Woo!